All right. It is six o'clock. So we will get started. Thank you very much for joining. So this is the first of a series of three webinars. We're going to talk about moats tonight, how to find them and identify them. Next week, we'll talk about business risks, so something people don't think about a lot when they're investing. And then finally, the third one in the series, we'll talk about ETFs and we'll talk about thematic and fundamental ETFs and how you should consider finding the right one for you and then using that within your portfolio. So before we begin, anything you hear tonight is general advice. I obviously don't know anything about you. I can't offer personal advice, but questions are always appreciated. So if you have any questions, pop them in the chat or put them into the Q&A and I will get to them as we go along. So without more of an introduction, we will dive in. So yes, how to identify moats. So that's what we're gonna talk about tonight. Before, of course, we get into this, we need to hear from our friend, Warren Buffett. So what did Buffett say? A good business is like a strong castle with a deep moat around it. I want sharks in the moats to keep away all those that would encroach on the castle. If you don't know what that means, hopefully you will by the end of it, what Buffett and what many investors mean when they talk about moats and the term moats. And more importantly, how you can actually identify them yourselves. So we'll walk through some examples of how to do this. All right, so let's start with a little bit of an example. And on this page is of course, the very, very brief story about Afterpay. So Afterpay was one of the first buy now, pay later companies. And I think going through a little bit of their history is illustrative of why moats matter and how we can go and find moats. But of course, we'll go, and go into some more details later. So like any business that's started, it all starts with an idea. And we're talking a lot, and we will talk a lot about business today, because that's what we're focused on when we're trying to identify moats or sustainable competitive advantages. And so Nick and Anthony had an idea. And their idea was that a new generation, specifically millennials of consumers, of course, wanted instant gratification, something that we like to say a lot about younger generations, but all of us probably want. But this generation did not trust credit cards after years of bashing of credit cards and the interest charge and everything else. This generation did not trust credit cards. At the same time, we had a bunch of merchants who wanted access to this generation of consumers. So what did they do? They created a company called Afterpay to bring these two concepts together. And that was their idea. And the new business model worked. So basically their business model for those that are not familiar with it, although I'm sure many people are, is that merchants of course paid a fee to Afterpay. And what they got is access to all of these new consumers, People that used Afterpay, many millennials initially, and then expanding to more people, they had the opportunity to go into debt. Obviously, I'm using this a little bit tongue in cheek without thinking they were going into debt, right? So we all know about this famous method where we pay off a purchase that we can't afford in four installments. And this idea worked. It worked with merchants. It worked with consumers who wanted to use this. And like any good business idea, of course, it expanded and grew quickly. But the issue is that everybody copied them. So there were all sorts of different startups in the buy now, pay later space that said they were at least slightly different, but really it was the same concept. And this created a couple problems. So the first one was all of a sudden merchants had all these different options. When there was one company out there in Australia after pay, they would pay obviously what they thought was worth it, but they would pay what after pay charge to get access to all these customers. And when there were more options, they of course could negotiate those fees and play those different competitors off each other. So the fees started to drop. This happened over years. We have to remember that. 
The other thing is that, of course, consumers had more choice, which made it a lot harder for Afterpay and then all of the new buy now, pay later customers to win new users. And it was really, really important to win new users because the larger the user base you had, the more attractive your buy now, pay later service was to each of the merchants who were, in fact, paying the bills. So what did you have to do, of course, if it's hard to win consumers and they're not just flocking to your business? You have to pay a bunch of money in marketing. Then all of a sudden, banks, credit card companies, technology companies like Apple, all became interested as well because they, for years, were taking a cut of all these transactions and they didn't want to see that go away. So they all entered the same space. And in many ways, this very, very short history of Afterpay and Buy Now, Pay Later is what we all face or what businesses face when they're out there competing. And we have to remember that capitalism, when it works properly, is competition. And this is supposed to bring benefits to consumers because we have more choice. Instead of just a single monopoly, we can go out and use different companies. Means we get better products because they're, of course, competing for us. So they want to create better products and services. And we get lower prices because pricing is a way that people compete. Now, that's all very good for us when capitalism works perfectly as consumers because we get all this stuff. More choice, better products, and lower prices. The problem is this isn't very good for a business. And we are not putting on our consumer hats today, although I'm going to ask you to wear them a little bit. We're really putting on our business owner hats because, of course, if we own a share, we are the owner of a business. So if we think about businesses and what they do, they compete in these two different ways, right? I said lowering prices. So consumers are price conscious. Lower prices typically means more consumers. They can create better goods and services. So that means investing in creating those better products and services, very simply through research and development. It also means increasing the perception of those goods and services or those brands. And the way they do that is marketing. All of this involves spending money. And remember, if we're thinking about this as a business owner, we don't want the companies we own to spend money. We want them to keep that money in profits for the owners of the business, which is us. So what does this mean if we go and we look at the financial statements of a company? What it means, lower margins. And the margin, of course, is the difference. And there's lots of different margins. But really, it's the difference between what something is sold for and what the company or the owners of the company gets to keep. And they can do all sorts of good things with the things they keep. They can pay us dividends. They can grow the business by investing in the business. They could pay back debt. They could go out there and buy another business. All potentially good things. So lower margin means they get to keep less of every sale they make, whether those prices are going down or whether the costs of operating that business are going up or both, most likely. And what that does is it lowers the return on capital invested in the business. And that, of course, is how much in those investments to grow the business, what return they're getting back. And that stuff actually matters. All right. And let's think about, once again, we've got our business hats on now. Let's think about how a company works. Well, pretty simply, and this is a very simplistic view of a company. A company is really a mechanism to go out there and raise capital efficiently. And they raise capital by borrowing money from bondholders, from banks. They issue equity. So they give people shares of the business in order to get money from them. That's another funding mechanism. So that, of course, if we're shareholders, we own a share of the company. At some point, a decision was made, even though you probably bought that share on a secondary market. At some point, a decision was made to give up control of that company or give up a portion of control of that company to raise capital. Or, of course, they have internally generated cash as well. But you need a return on that, right, if they want to invest that in the business. So a company takes this capital that they raise, they invest it in the business, 
hoping to earn a return. And broadly, there are three different outcomes that can happen. They can earn a return that is higher than their cost of capital. And that's a very good thing because, of course, if you can borrow money, to use a simplistic example, if you can borrow money for 5% and earn 10% when you invested in the company, that's a really good thing. And that extra return that we're getting over the cost of capital, that accrues to shareholders over time. And it will compound. It'll keep building and building and building on itself over time. Shareholders typically do very well in this scenario. You could earn a return that is equal to your cost of capital. And we'll talk about why this does happen. You borrow at 5% and then you earn a return that's 5%. Now, this isn't a disaster, but it's also not a good thing. What does that mean? It means the company stays in business and it means it can still grow, right? If I'm still investing a bunch of money in this business, even if I'm earning the same return, I can still grow that business. So these companies can still grow. And then the third outcome, which is certainly the worst outcome, is that if the company earns a return that's lower than its cost of capital, eventually it will go out of business. Borrowing at 5% and earning a 1% return on that is not a recipe for success. Now, of course, in the real world, this is a mixture of all sorts of different investments. So we're looking at average, right? And all sorts of different funding sources. So we're looking at the average cost of capital, what we call the weighted average cost of capital. And then we're looking at the average return on capital invested in that company. So the average return on invested capital. Now, if you sit there and you look at these three scenarios, we can talk about what happens in the real world over the long term. We believe at Morningstar and basically anyone who is a proponent of a moat and uses that terminology, moat or sustainable competitive advantage, we believe that over the long term, the impacts of capitalism, the impacts of that competition will drive most companies down to earning a return that is very, very similar to the cost of capital. Now, that may not make sense to you, but if we think about a company, a company is a going concern. It's an entity within itself. It's employing people. It has generally pretty highly paid leadership of that company. So they're going to keep trying. They're going to keep trying to earn higher returns, but we don't think over time they're actually going to succeed because of the impact of that competition. So we think most companies will fall into this middle bucket. But as investors, what we want is we want to, earn, we want to own these companies, these companies that can earn that higher rate of return. And how do you do that? Well, you do that by holding those natural forces of competition at bay. And that is having a competitive advantage over other companies you're competing with. It's having a sustainable competitive advantage because we want that to last over the long term. And that is what a mode is, very simply. So if that is a little bit over your head, we will go through some examples, teach you how you can try to find companies with those moats. But that simplistically is how business works. And it's simplistically why companies have such a hard time competing against other companies, competing for our consumer dollars. And that is why it is also so good to find companies that can earn a return that is for a sustainable or a long period of time, higher than their cost of capital. All right, so we're gonna move on. How to find a moat. Now, generally the way that we hear about moats is we hear somebody like Warren Buffett or a portfolio manager or a Morningstar analyst declare that a certain company has a moat. But it seems like almost this mythical thing that how are they able to say this? How would we know as just retail everyday investors how a company has a moat? But remember, we have to think of ourselves as 
businessmen, students of business, when we are sitting there looking at companies and the effect of competition and how those companies interact. And I do really like how Buffett explains this. He talks about that he is not a stock picker. He is a company picker. So he is a student of business to try to find those businesses that he wants to own for the long time. So of course, to be like Buffett, to be like the people that say they have identified moats, you need to be a student of business. And a lot of this is just training the way that you think. So you need to train yourself to think about different businesses. And the easiest way to do this is to, of course, think about your own spending or your family spending or your friend's spending. Just think about everyday products that you use and go through a bit of a checklist when you're looking at these. Would you switch to a competing product if there's a slightly lower price? Because remember, we said one of the ways that companies compete is they compete with pricing. And in general, consumers respond to price changes. And we've seen this a lot in the last couple of years, obviously, with inflation. A lot of people are having to make choices about what they're going to spend their money on, what they're not, where they can cut back, where they can substitute. But think about those goods that you buy every day and think about what would cause you to switch. Would a slight price difference switch make you switch? Well, there's definitely not a moat there. If there's a larger price difference. Well, maybe there could be a moat. But also, that's something where a competitor can come in, simply lower prices and take market share from that company take away their customers. Are there constantly new innovations in a good or service? Meaning, are there two different brands? So if we want to use phones, for example, if every time Samsung comes out with a slightly better phone, you switch to a Samsung, then you switch back to an Apple and they come out with a slightly better phone. Well, once again, if that is the case, there most likely isn't a moat. Because remember, in order to create that slightly better phone, a company has to spend a lot on research and development. That will lower their margins, that will lower the returns on invested capital. And it's not a sustainable competitive advantage if somebody can come around and just copy them and build something a little bit better, which causes them to go back and do the same thing. So there likely isn't a moat there. Is it a product or service that becomes more valuable if more people use it? So this means that even if there's a competing good or service, it doesn't have as much value. And we'll go through some examples of all this in a little bit. Well, if you don't care how many people use it, if you don't care how many people go and buy a Coca-Cola every day and has no impact whatsoever on your consumption choices, well, then there probably isn't. A moat. What does it take to deliver that product or service? Remember, we're putting our business hat on there. Think about the costs. Are some companies able to deliver that product or service for cheaper? Well, remember, that's a moat as well. When we start thinking about higher margins and when we start thinking about the return you get on investments, well, if somebody's able to produce that for a lot cheaper, well, that could be a moat. If there's no difference in delivering that service, then there probably isn't one. And then is there anything that prevents new people from coming in and competing? Remember, we talked about the buy now, pay later space, just as an example. There was nothing that stopped anyone from competing. There was nothing that stopped the guys behind Zip from starting a new company to compete with Afterpay. There was nothing that prevented credit card companies and banks and Apple and everyone else to introduce the exact same service, basically. So think about if there's anything in there that might stop people from competing. Well, if there isn't, if anybody can do this, not just anybody off the street, but anybody that has a little bit of funding then and a little bit of know-how, then there probably isn't a moat. And one really important thing to remember is that the first mover advantage, we want a sustainable competitive advantage. So the first mover advantage that anyone has when they come up with a new idea, remember that that is not a moat. It could be a moat, but that's not necessarily a moat. So if you come up with a great business idea and maybe you have you know, 
three, five years head start on somebody. Well, that's not a sustainable competitive advantage. We want to look at those competitive advantages that are sustainable over the long term. So just separate in your head the company or the people or whoever else that introduces a product or service first doesn't necessarily mean that that's a moat. Think about, once again, what would it take for a new or existing company to come out and compete with them? All right. So, do have a question. Any idea how many companies are in the buy now, pay later space? No, I do not. I do not have any idea globally. Um, what I would say is there's been a lot of consolidation um, because of those issues that we saw with margins coming down, um, basically the fees that they could charge retailers coming down, harder to win new customers. And honestly, if you go back and look at Zip's um, financial statements, you can see it. You can actually see that they were, they've never been profitable, but you can see, and I'm picking Zip because Afterpay is no longer publicly traded by itself. So it's harder to break it down. If you go look at Zip, you can see when they first became a company, and most companies are unprofitable when they start. Um, but you can see that they were slowly, and their margin was negative because they weren't making money, but slowly that negative margin was getting smaller and smaller. So they were approaching profitability. And then all of a sudden, we had this huge glut of competitors. You can see it going straight down. It got more and more negative. And we can see the same thing on the return on invested capital. Um, but what they did is... Zip bought some people. There was a lot of consolidation in the industry. And that's often how companies will respond to all these new competitors. Okay. And it's not obviously something that can happen forever. Well, we don't really want to compete with them anymore. So we'll just buy them. Um, so you often see a lot of consolidation, particularly in some of these new, um, some of these new industries that come out. Uh, and Lisa has a question. Do tech companies like Afterpay and NVIDIA have a bit of sustainability or moat conflict? Because although intellectual property is low cost, once it's up and running, competition becomes a price threat. Yes, that's a really good point, Lisa. We're going to get into that in one second. All right. So to help you think about moats, and once again, to think like a student of business, we have five different moat sources at Morningstar. So all of the companies that we say has a moat, so whether it is a wide moat, which we believe will last for more than 10, 20 years, or a narrow moat, which we believe will last around 10 years, more than 10 years, we categorize them in these five categories. Now, a company can have multiple moat sources. We call these our moat sources. So I'll go through these. I'll give you a couple of examples of them. But knowing these at least provides a framework where you can start thinking about different industries and thinking about how a company would develop a sustainable competitive advantage and how they could actually maintain that. So the first one is network effect. And I alluded to a lot of these when I was going through doing that introduction. So you guys can read, but a network effect occurs when the value of a company's goods or services increase for both new and existing users as more people use them. We see this a lot with technology. So the example, of course, that we always use, and I'll use some other ones, is social media, right? What is the point of social media? The point is, and I ask myself that every time I'm on it, but the real point of social media, of course, is to interact with other people. So you want to share things with your friends, family, strangers, whether that's some rant about politics or whether it's pictures from your latest vacation. You want to share those with people. It only really has value for you as a user if, you have, if there are other people on there, right? And how do social media companies monetize themselves? Well, they sell advertising. The only way that a social media company is valuable to an advertiser is if there are lots of people on it. So that's an example of a good or service where the value increases the more people that are on there. We also see this a lot around payment platforms, right? So the more people, whether you are using a peer-to-peer -peer payment platform, the more people on there, the more valuable it is because you can actually send them money 
or even if we go back and look at something like credit cards, for example, right? What makes Visa and MasterCard so powerful? Well, the fact that lots of people have the cards and the fact that you can use them pretty much everywhere. So that's an example of the more people in that network, that network effect builds up the value. Same thing, communication, same thing, e-commerce, right? We want to sell to a lot of customers. We want to use that platform to connect sellers and buyers. Well, that platform needs a lot of people on it. So remember that the whole point of any of these goods and services, and think about them, think about businesses that fall in there, is to interact and connect people. So the more people we have on there, the more value that is to users, to advertisers, to sellers, to whoever is getting connected by that platform. So think about technology companies when it comes to network effect and how that actually works. All right, intangible assets. So this is the second of the moat sources. Now, traditionally, back, you know, mostly before technology, but if we went back to the early 1900s, what mattered for a lot of companies? Well, tangible assets. What are things that we can see on a balance sheet? Things that we hold on a balance sheet. So a balance sheet, of course, accounts for all the assets and all the liabilities of a company. So something tangible that could be on there could be a factory. The more factories we have, the more we can produce. We want to expand production, we'll create another factory. Now, tangible assets are still important for some companies, but in many ways, they're less important. And a lot of that's through technology and things like that. But when we're talking about intangible assets, we're talking about things that benefit that company that we cannot see on the balance sheet. We cannot assign a value to them. So a patent, a brand. So a brand where you go in there and you are always going to buy, whether it costs a little bit more or not, you're always going to buy a particular brand of whatever you're looking for. Um, if that has a value um, to you as a consumer, well, that can be a moat source. Regulatory licenses. So once again, we can't see regulatory licenses and we've seen in the market in the last couple of days, you know, Star, for example, their share price plunging. We have to remember that a lot of the value of Star was the fact that for a while, before Crown opened here, I'm just pointing at the building because it's over there, where apparently Taylor Swift is, um, which people in the office were excited about. I have not ventured over there to stand in the lobby with, with everyone else. But Star, for a long time, was the only casino in Sydney because it was the only casino that the government would issue a license to. Now, that license has an incredible amount of value for Star, a little less with Crown, but it effectively limits competition. Now, that license right now is an interesting one because, of course, they are getting in a lot of trouble for things that they did. People are worried that that license might be taken away or that a lot of restrictions will have to be imposed on them. So the good side of getting an exclusive government license is the fact that it can be a moat or sustainable competitive advantage. The bad side is you need to listen to all the government rules and that license could be taken away potentially. But a government license could be a moat source as well. So all of these are things that prevent, so a patent, a brand that's trademarked, a regulatory license, all of these things are legal mechanisms or in the case of a brand, you know, it's a trademark, but also that brand equity you built up. All these things are things that prevent competitors from actually going out and competing with them. So they're all moat sources. Now, intangible assets can apply to almost any industry. So they can be government, a government can apply one of these. And the reason they do this in the case of patents, of course, is because they want innovation. They want a drug company or a pharmaceutical company to go out there and invest a lot of money trying to cure a disease. And how do they encourage them to do that? They say, if you come up with something that treats a certain disease, you have exclusive rights 
to that treatment for a set period of time. Same thing with the patent around an invention. We want people to put effort into inventing new things. And so once, of course, they're able to do that, well, that can be um, the government rewards you by giving you exclusive use of that idea that you've generated. So I think that gets back to your question, uh, Lisa, about NVIDIA and some of these technology companies. Well, patents can be a source of moat for these uh, for these companies. Brands, of course, brands are trademarks. You can't copy them. But really what a company needs to do is it needs to build up, whether it's consumers or businesses, whoever's consuming that product, they need to build up, of course, that brand equity. So they need to be known for something. So that can be every time I go and buy this particular brand, I know that it's very high quality. And so I'm going to spend a little extra money on it because I know that it's high quality. It could be because it's perceived as or it gives you some sort of perception. So if we think about expensive I don't know, any sort of expensive clothing, things like that, that wearing that is as the person wearing it, that I am giving off this perception that I want other people to have. And they have to build that. And they can build that through quality. They can build that through pricing. Um, there's all sorts of ways that you can do that. But brands can be a very, very powerful source of moats. And of course, we talked about local and national governments. And this can be anything. This can be that there is currently one airport in Sydney. Now, obviously, they're building a second one, but nobody's going to pop up and build a third airport without getting all sorts of government approval for that. So those are all cases where a government or some sort of government regulatory body can offer exclusivity to a certain company. And what they'll generally do that for is investment. So somebody that wants to go there and build the airport, they'll do that um, because they may set certain rates, but those rates are generally set at a level where the company can make money. If we talk about Transurban, for example, everyone complains about toll prices. Well, all those toll prices were agreed by the government. And so Transurban said, okay, well, we can make money doing this and... They set jointly that that uh, the toll schedule, the increases in tolls that uh, that happen periodically. Well, that is a government body bestowing that on a company, and that is a source of moat. So remember, this can apply to almost anything. Um, Yeah, exactly. So Lisa saying, along with her comment about Taylor Swift, um, is saying the uh, the moat can be what the public associates with the brand. Absolutely, that's a brand, right? Companies spend a lot of money to build their brands. They spend a lot of money to, of course, advertise and market those brands. They build those brands in lots of different ways. Over time, that can be a moat source, um, so that you know I can't create my own clothing label and all of a sudden go out there and compete with some of these high fashion clothing labels. I can build it. I can make a shirt, but I can't put a little symbol on that shirt and I can't sell it under a brand name. And that has a, uh, that has a real value. So cost advantage, we obviously touched on this one before. So there are firms that have what we call structural cost advantages. And that means that they can compete on price in two different ways. Um, <laughs> that is funny, Lisa. Um, <laughs> they can compete on price in two different ways. They could decide to have their prices be the same as competitors, but because they can create that good or service for cheaper, they make more money. Their margin is higher. Or they can undercut competitors that have higher costs and they can win market share. So having that structural cost advantage, remember, we want that to be a long-term cost advantage, is really, really important. In general, we get those cost advantages through scale. So we want to think about what businesses benefit from scale. And a good example of this that maybe sometimes people don't think about, a good example is banks. So if we think of the big four banks in Australia, and you go and you actually look at the financial statements of 
one member of the big four or all members of the big four. And then sort of the, you know, regional banks or those middle-sized banks that are competing with them, you will see their margins are a lot higher. You'll see that their net interest margin is generally a lot higher. Now, why is that? Well, one way that a big bank is beneficial is that, of course, to run a bank, you need some centralized services. So whether that's the regulatory requirements that you need to adhere to, whether it's just the systems that operate, your ATM machines, your online banking, everything else. Well, if we can spread that cost out across a larger base of customers, it's lower per customer. They can make more money on customers. The other place where the big four banks do very well compared to some of their rivals in Australia is they do it in their cost of funding. Because they're big, because they have at least this implicit guarantee from the government um, that uh, that they're not going to go under, their funding sources are cheaper, which is a huge part of how a bank gets money. So that can be external funding when they go out there and have to raise money when they're borrowing money to, uh, to fund their capital. And also because banks, of course, take in deposits. So those large deposit bases that they have, all the people that are using the big four banks, well, that's a source of really cheap funding. Switching costs. Think about the goods and services that you use that you may see a competitor out there with a better product, or you may see a competitor out there that have cheaper prices, but it is a huge pain to switch to a different service provider. Well, that is a moat or a moat source. If it's really, really time consuming or expensive for you to switch from one provider to another, chances are you're not going to do it. You're not going to do it because most of us are lazy. You're not going to do it because you don't want to kick out that upfront cost to make that switch. Um, Even if over the long run you save money, there are at least a lot of consumers that won't actually make that switch. So switching, is, switching costs is a moat source. And banks, once again, talk about banks quickly, we'll move into something else. Banks benefit from switching costs. As you think about the way that you use a bank, at least if you're me, you may have multiple different products from that bank. You could have a mortgage and a savings account, some term deposits and a credit card. Well, it's a lot of stuff to switch to someone else. You may also have all of your friends in there. So if you go out to dinner, you can send them money afterwards. All the different people that you want to pay bills to, you're still working, you have your direct deposit going into that account. It's a pain. So people don't want to switch banks. So if we think about how banks compete, obviously with service and things like that, but also on interest rates that they pay you. If you go out there and you see this new bank has a slightly higher interest rate, are you going to switch all of your accounts over? Probably not. And that, of course, allows, once again, banks to have lower cost of funding if they have a lot of customers. Who has a lot of customers in Australia? The big four banks. It makes it very hard for people to come in and compete with them because nobody wants to go through the effort of switching to a new bank. The other way that this happens is often in software. And if we think about the way software works, particularly for businesses, is it takes a lot of time and effort if you are putting in a new payroll system, for example, or anything that's sort of core to your business. So you spend all this money and this effort putting in this technology that's embedded throughout your company, you generally don't want to switch. So even once again, if something is slightly better or something costs slightly less, You really don't want to go out there and spend the time and the effort and disruption for all your employees that have to learn the new software. You don't want to do that. And so that's another example where we see a lot of switching costs. Um, So that's that's another moat source. Finally, the last of our five moat sources is efficient scale. I tend to find that this one is something that's harder for people to wrap their arms around. But really what we're talking about is concentrated sort of these niche markets. And there's a couple different examples that I always use. But what it means is that the 
profit, the number of customers available, the number of revenue, the total addressable market, however we want to um, talk about that, is limited. And if it's already dominated by one or a couple companies, then it becomes very, very hard and costly for a new company to break in. And there's a couple different examples we can use. One is, of course, pharmaceutical companies. So, of course, there are the big diseases, quote unquote. A big disease, of course, is something that lots and lots of people have. Lots of people have this disease. A lot of healthcare dollars are spent in trying to prevent or treat that disease. And so, of course, you'll see all sorts of, even though, of course, there are, there are patents involved, you will see all sorts of pharmaceutical companies going out there and competing for like a cancer treatment, for example. Because in general, lots of people globally get cancer. Obviously, they want to treat it. And so companies will go out there and compete a lot. But if you have a disease that a very small number of people have, and there's already a really effective treatment for that disease, well, companies are less interested in spending all the research and development dollars, which might cost as much as the quote unquote big disease. They're not interested in spending all that money for uh, that relatively small number of patients. The other place we see this a lot is infrastructure. I talked about the airports in Sydney, for example, but if we go over to New Zealand and we look at Auckland Airport, for example, Auckland Airport actually has no license granted by the government. So I'm not saying anyone can go out and build an airport, but you can go out and build an airport a lot easier, apparently, in New Zealand than you can in Australia, where there are these licenses that are granted. But is anyone going to do that? Probably not. When they're sitting there and looking at the potential profit from building a second airport in Auckland, are you really going to go through all that time and expense to potentially just take a little bit of market share from an existing airport? But we see this airport sometimes. We see it certainly with, uh, with uh, railroads that if somebody is going to build a railroad um, to a relatively small market and they are making money transporting goods or people or whatever else they're transporting somebody going to go build a rail line next to them probably not because once again if that market's not big enough to serve two railroads you're really just setting yourself up for ruinous competition so people are likely or companies are likely not to do that so that's the other place where we see efficient scale come into play all right so what is the impact of moats? And I wanted to use uh, I wanted to use this um, table. It's a little bit dated. You can see this from 2017. But remember, I said that a moat will actually show up in financial statements. And we talked about margin, and we talked about the return on the capital we invest in a business. And this is just a breakdown. So as you can see, we go and we took all the companies at the time in 2017, within our coverage universe, we divided them up into wide moat, narrow moat, and no moat. So you can see the number of companies that received each one of those ratings. Remember a wide moat, we believe they have a sustainable competitive advantage for 20 or more years, 10 years for narrow moat, and then no moat. Those are the companies that we see over time that we think over the long term they won't earn returns that are much higher than their cost of capital. So you can see a couple measures on here. So ROIC is return on invested capital. TTM is trailing 12 months. So once again, remember the return that we want to earn on the capital we invest in the company, we want to find those companies where it's much higher than their cost of capital. You can see by relatively wide margin, wide moats had higher returns. So that is, uh, so that is, of course, a very good thing. Narrow moats at higher returns, and then if we go down here to this none category, not great returns, right? When we think about that, earning a return of five percent on the capital that's actually invested in that company, well, that's not, uh, that's not great. 
Um, so we can see the impact right there of moats. Um, and then we've got trailing three years instead of trailing 12 months. Then we've got 10 years. So we can really see that impact right there. Um, and obviously it's all going up over those longer periods of time, but um, yeah, interesting, uh, interesting view. Then of course, we're looking at two different types of margin. Remember I said there were lots of margin, margin, at a high level is the difference between what you are um, what you are selling goods and services for and what you get to keep in profit. So when we're looking at operating margin, really what we're looking at is just the operations of a company. Um, so what is the company actually doing? And then there's all these other costs associated with, uh, there's all these other costs associated with, um, with running a company as well, all those kind of central non-core things that a company does. So we're looking at operating margins, always going to be higher than net margin. We're looking at operating margin. We're just looking at kind of what they do. If you're a Qantas, what do you do? Well, you fly people um, between places. Um, what is not their core business, but still important, all the other stuff a corporation needs to have, the head office and all that other stuff. If we look at net margin, we are looking top to bottom line. So we're looking at revenue and we're looking at profit that comes out the bottom, top line of financial statement. That's revenue, the bottom line or of an income statement, the bottom line is revenue. That's why we use top line and bottom line. You can see here in both cases, the margin is significantly higher for wide moat companies versus narrow moat companies versus no moat companies. Um, so it's just a demonstration of what this actually means over the long term. Now, one thing I would say before I get into some of the questions is that we do need to remember as investors, the only thing we care about is the future. So that is why you can't just go and look at financial statements and look at things like this that are on this page and say, hey, here's a company that has a higher margin that may continue into the future, or it might just be the case of a first mover advantage, things like that. So we do need to still think about those businesses and think about, and we can use those financial statements as jumping off points. Why do they have a higher margin? Do they have a higher margin because they were the first ones to introduce a product and they could charge higher prices before competition came in? Or do they have a higher margin because structurally there's a cost advantage they have to producing that good or service? So remember, we always need to look forward, but in investing, we always use the past to inform us looking forward. We still need to think about the business and think about the different competitors out there, both existing competitors and then potential competitors as well. As well. Um, so we had that question about return on equity and return on invested capital. So that question was answered correctly. So return on invested capital is all the capital that is invested within that company. Return on equity is just that, the return of the equity portion of, uh, of the capital that a company raises. So people use them a lot. Um, yeah, they use them a lot, um, I guess, interchangeably. Um, and yeah, the differences are kind of, as I said, a little bit technical. But really, when we look at measures like return on invested capital and return on the uh, and return on equity, what we want to do is we want to compare companies within the same industry. Same thing with margins, because just remember, there are low margin industries and there's very high margin industries. Good example, I guess this is a little bit of a deviation, but just the point is a good example of a low margin industry is uh, supermarkets, Coles and Woolies, right? They want to sell a lot of stuff. They may not make a lot of money on each thing that they sell, but they're really looking for volume games. Some have higher margins. Same thing with the return on equity. Same thing with the return on invested capital. Particularly what we see is that companies that are very scalable, you could get very high returns on equity, returns on invested capital. Um, companies not as scalable that are very like capital intensive companies where you have to continue to raise money and invest to grow your production. Those companies typically have a lot lower ones. Um, so just make sure you're comparing in the industry. So you can use both. We, our analysts use return on invested capital. You can use both, but just make sure that you're not comparing Microsoft 
with Kohl's because you're going to be very disappointed in that comparison. That doesn't make Kohl's a bad business because they are not making software. They are selling high margin or selling low margin, high volume groceries. Um, so something to think about. Okay. So Charlie says you compare price to earnings to the width of the moat and compound average growth rate over 10 years, for example, total returns. All right. It's a really good question. Now, the focus of today was looking at, once again, we were putting our student of business hats on and we were looking at the competitive landscape that a company operates in. When we talk about great businesses that we want to buy and have in our portfolios, what most investors are talking about is they're talking about companies with moats and sustainable competitive advantages. But remember, that is only part of the equation when you're going out there and investing in something. So if I said that Microsoft is a great company, there would not be a lot of people arguing with me. For a lot of these companies, the moats are obvious, um, whether it's Microsoft or Apple, all these technology companies we always hear about, um, whether it's you know the banks in Australia, the big four banks, which are great businesses. A lot of this stuff is maybe obvious is pushing it too far, but a lot of this stuff is widely agreed upon. Of course, investors are generally willing to pay more and will continue to pay more for great companies. So then the other side of the argument says, are you getting a decent price for that great company? So yes, valuation, and you use PE, uh, price earnings, as an example, Charlie, valuation matters as well. So going out and finding a great company and paying a really high price for it isn't the way that you're going to earn outsized returns. So just remember that. This is just another input into your investment process. But there are certainly opportunities, maybe not established companies, but thinking about new entrants, or maybe there isn't that consensus yet that there's a moat. And of course, you can read, in any one of our analyst report, you can read, obviously, if our analyst thinks there's a moat. But I think more interesting is not just looking at that moat rating, but I think reading through why they think there's a moat and the evidence that they present to suggest that there's a moat. Because doing that, I think, allows you to then think about moats, which hopefully today did a little bit, and then maybe apply that to emerging companies where there isn't that consensus. And that could be an opportunity where you could go out there and find a bargain. You could find a company before everyone else thinks it's great, before that valuation goes up. Um, so remember, you're always going to pay more for great companies. You're always going to pay more for growth. That's not necessarily a bad thing. It's how much you're paying for that great company, how much you're paying for growth. So yeah, you need to use in conjunction with everything else you're doing to evaluate a uh, to evaluate a share. Um, and that valuation level, to kind of finish Charlie's answer, that will, of course, impact those total returns. So it's really a combination. So really, you know, I think the argument would be, okay, if you find a Morningstar five-star rated stock, with a wide moat, then that is something that our analysts have strong conviction in being a company that's going to perform very well over the long term from a share price perspective. Um, so Nick is saying, do you weight the five moats differently? If so, what factors do you consider in weighting the moats by sector or market maturity, et cetera? Okay. So we do not weight the five moats. What we do is any company that falls within, that our analysts believe exhibits those moat sources that I talked about could have a wide moat rating. So just a single moat source, whatever you want to pick, network effect, that equals a wide moat. So we're not weighting them. There are companies, and it says it in our analyst report, they'll talk about why they think each one of these moat sources is prevalent. There are companies that have multiple moat sources. So that isn't going to give somebody um, a higher rating. What our analysts will do, because you can't get any higher than wide. You don't get wide, double wide. 
What an analyst will do is there are companies that do lots of different things. So I know sort of this conglomerate model has, you know, sort of fallen by the wayside, but there are companies that do different things. So there are some research reports where the analysts will say, we don't think the company has a moat, but there's a portion of the business where we think they have a moat, but we don't think that that's a big enough influence given everything that they do for that moat to be prevalent. And they'll talk about that in the research reports. So I guess the only way that they will weight something is in that case, where they will say, okay, one part of the business we think has a moat, the rest of the stuff they do, we don't think, um, but it doesn't make up enough of that company for us to give it an overall moat rating. Um, so yeah, that is, uh, that's something they'll, they'll do. Um, Yep, we have a question. Would you be able to share these slides and a recording to watch again? I can do all that. I will put my email address in the chat. So as always, if you have questions or comments or just want to stay high, um, you can email me and I am happy to share the slides um, with anybody that sends me an email to that address. So that is in the uh, that's in the webinar chat. Um, we will have a recording, hopefully. What's today? Tuesday. Hopefully this week, uh, but it generally takes us a little bit to get the recording. But we will have a recording. So if you email me, I'll send you the recording when it's available. We'll also post it on our website, um, so you can access it there. Anyway, that was fast. Although it is six fifty six. Thank you guys very much for joining. Really appreciate it. Uh, I'll be back next week. We'll talk about business risk, um, which I think is interesting. And hopefully people show up for that. But anyway, thank you guys very much for joining. I hope you all have a good night. This video has been prepared for clients of Morningstar Australasia Proprietary Limited and or New Zealand Wholesale clients of Morningstar Research Limited. Any general advice has been provided without reference to your financial objectives, situation or needs. You should consider the advice in light of these matters and any relevant product disclosure statement before making any decision to invest. To obtain advice for your own situation, contact a financial advisor.